For all the knowledge about the universe we've amassed since Albert Einstein proposed his theory of general relativity a hundred years ago, much more is simply unintelligible to us. From dark matter to dark energy, most of the universe is filled with stuff we have yet to fathom. Dr. Catherine Fries has made it her life's work to shed light on those dark corners of the universe. She is the George E. Uhlenbeck Professor of Physics at the University of Michigan, visiting professor at Stockholm University, and the author of The Cosmic Cocktail, Three Parts Dark Matter. And Dr. Catherine Fries joins us now from Waterloo, Ontario. It's great to have you on the program tonight, Dr. Fries. And I want to start by asking, what percentage of the universe do you think is still unintelligible to us at this point? Well, this is an amazing story. So if you take everything from our daily experience, your body, the air, the walls, the chair I'm sitting on, throw in the Earth, all the stars and planets. Now, all of that is made of atoms, and that part of the universe we understand. But all of that adds up to only 5% of the total of the universe. So that means we're left with 95% that we really don't know exactly the nature. And it's the dark side of the universe, and that's what we're working to try to understand. Of the remaining 95%, then, what do you suspect it is? Well, this is why I called my book The Cosmic Cocktail, because the universe is like a cocktail. So in addition to the ordinary stuff that we know about, then you would have, a, let, let's make a cocktail, a 10-ounce cocktail. Well, almost three ounces of it would be in the form of dark matter, and seven ounces in the form of dark energy. And then, by the way, you'd have about a millionth of an ounce in supermassive black holes. So just to make the distinction, dark matter and black holes are not the same thing. But, uh, and then all, all, all of the ordinary stuff barely adds up to much of anything. Okay, I suspect people have a good understanding of what a black hole is, but dark matter and dark energy, not so much. So let's go through that. What's dark matter? When, when, we talk, when we use the word dark in dark matter, we just mean that it doesn't shine. It doesn't give off light. So as far as our own galaxy, what that's made of, the Milky Way has a very a, a, a thin plane, we call it the disk, and that's where all the stars are sitting. So it's kind of like a pinwheel, and the sun is out along one of these pinwheel arms, but that flat piece is only a tiny part of the total galaxy, so in fact, there's this giant spherical region that's all made of dark matter. And so again, it's just so, it's stuff that we know is there, it's massive, but it doesn't shine, and, and, and we're not sure what it's made of. Well, if it doesn't give off life and it doesn't shine, how did we discover it was there in the first place? The amazing thing is that we've actually known about this for 80 years at this point. So there was a, the, the first people to discover this, there was a man in Sweden named Knut Lundmark, and then another one, Fritz Zwicky, who was working at Caltech. And so what, what Zwicky noticed is when he looked at a cluster of galaxies, he saw some of those galaxies moving very, very rapidly. They're whizzing around. And he couldn't understand those motions based on the stellar light that he knew about, so he thought, well, something else is pulling on them to speed them up, and, he, and that's called dunkle materie, which is the German for dark matter. So the, there are, in order for things to move this rapidly, there has to be some new kind of mass that was not understood, and he called it dark because it doesn't give off light. So that was the original evidence for dark matter. It was already in the 1930s. But then it really took another 40 years to be certain that this problem really existed everywhere in the universe, and that's the work of Vera Rubin. It's where she looked at galaxies throughout the universe and found the same phenomenon, that things are moving around the center of galaxies really, really fast, and if you want to understand that, you have to posit that there's some new kind of mass that's not giving off light. And how about dark energy? What's that? Oh boy, dark energy. Now that's, that's, what I, that's the elephant in the room. <laughs> that's 70% that's of the total and we're really quite lost as to, as to what it is. The amazing thing was at the turn of the millennium, people realized that the universe is not just expanding, but it's actually accelerating. So on the average, galaxies are moving apart from one another, but as time goes on, they're moving faster and faster away from, from one another. And so there's something going on. Well, it can't be matter, because matter is attractive. It feels gravity has to be something that's giving some kind of effective repulsive force. 
So that's, that's this bizarre thing that we call dark energy simply because we don't know, we really don't know anything about it. So that's really the tough one for, for future generations to solve. Okay, I next need you to explain to us two very cute acronyms that I gather are competing theories of explaining what we've just been talking about. And the acronyms mm -hmm. are macho and wimp. What are macho and wimp? Okay, so machos, massive compact halo objects. So these were popular about 20 years ago. People thought, well, the dark matter could be made of, okay, it's not bright stars, but what if it's faint stars or it's planetary objects or something like that? And so I was, I was one of the people who showed that actually that is not going to solve the dark matter problem. There cannot be enough machos around to, to, uh, to solve the problem. So then on the other side of the debate, there's the WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. These are exotic new particles, new in the sense that, well, we haven't seen them yet, but that's what we think is the best bet for the dark matter, and that's, I've been working on, on the theory side of, and making predictions for what experiments should see for these WIMPs, and now there are detectors all over the world that are waiting to find these particles. Hmm. And by the way, if WIMPs are the dark matter, there are a billion of them going through you every second, but you know, they're not knocking you over. <laughs> and the reason is that the only kind of interaction they have is weak interactions, and those really are weak interactions, and hence the name weakly interacting massive particles. Yeah, so we... in this debate between the WIMPs and the machos, I can only see that WIMPs beat machos. <laughs> <laughs> only this time, though. Um, you have said, though, that at various times in your scientific career, You've thought at first it was one potential explanation, then maybe another time you went for another potential explanation. Now, in the yeah. world of politics, yeah. they call that flip-flopping. What do they call it in the scientific world? Progress. <laughs> <laughs> because? Well, you make, you know, you hypothesize something and then you go and check in the data. So we used Hubble Space Telescope data, we used other data, and you say, okay, those, those small, faint stars, they're just not there. That's bad luck for you. You have to try something different. And so then you try the next thing. And the WIMPs are really well motivated on theoretical grounds. So I'm really, um, and, and not only that, but there are some hints of detection in a variety of different te detection techniques. So I'm really hoping that we're going to have this problem resolved in the next decade. So things look positive that we might have it right this time. OK, and in 10 years' time, if in fact we do resolve this uh, by the end of the decade, uh, or a decade from now, rather, then what? We'll have this knowledge, and therefore, what? The, the, I think the main answer to this question is, since antiquity, people have looked out into the universe, and they've asked big questions. Who are we? Why are we here? How did, the, how did it all begin? What is out there? And I think those desire to answer those questions, this kind of curiosity, is also why humans survived as a species. Because you go out there, and you make new tools based on what you discover, and, and, and so forth. And so just answering the, one of the big questions of what the universe is made of, oh, that's enough for me. That's a, that's a very mm. exciting prospect. But on the other hand, there is a second feature, and w which is why governments fund us to do this research, other than the pure intellectual curiosity, and that is that every time you have a major discovery in science, it'll have some kind of offshoot, some serendipitous uh, use that we are not even predicting. So if, if people... This is, this is how progress on the technological side works, is that you have the fundamental science that accidentally leads you in a direction you never expected, and there you go, life changes. Hmm. I'd like some better understanding of why you are a theoretical physicist to begin with. What was the moment where you had some interaction with this field and then concluded, this is for me? I, I, there are many pieces to this story, but one of them is that I was fortunate in that my parents were scientists. Not just my father, but also my mother. They, were, they did groundbreaking work in molecular biology. So the idea that a woman could be a scientist was not foreign to me. So that, and they were very encouraging that when, I, when I was interested. So that, that, I think that was, that was a good start. Then I also, when I was 15 years old, I went to summer school at the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. And, Learn a little bit about relativity, just enough to think, oh my god, this work of Einstein's is mind-boggling, these, these bizarre paradoxes that arise based on his theory, and I thought, I have to learn more about this. So that really got me going and got me wanting to go study this when I, when I got to college. 
So I've I think those, those two pieces were important. I've also heard you say you are a theorist by temperament. What does that mean? Um, experimental groups nowadays are gigantic. And that doesn't work for me. I need to go into a room, close the door, and do some thinking. So I, I, I tried out. I started out as an experimental physicist, and I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't working for me. So I switched to something that, as far as my personality, I think suits me better. Now, I'm not saying that all I do is sit in a room and close the door, because the fun, a lot of the fun is when we collaborate. So we sit around a table, a few of us, two or three of us, my friends, and it's a lot of fun, and then we throw ideas out there, and you write on the back of an envelope, or usually a napkin. You try out the simple mathematics, will this idea work or not, and 99% of the time it doesn't. But once in a while you have an idea that you say, okay, let's pursue this more. And then you go back into your room and you do some thinking and some working on your own. And then you get back together and, and you, you, you move forward and see, well, is this working? Does it match nature or not? And even at this stage, usually it doesn't. But every now and then it does, and that's like, woohoo, let's go. Let's <laughs> solve the mysteries of the universe. So that's what I'm hoping is going to happen with the work that I did in dark matter with, with my friends 25 years ago, I hate to admit it, and I'm hoping that that leads to discovery. I gather, though, there was a moment in your life many years ago where you were at a bit of a fork in the road. It could have been acting for you, or it could have been science, and science won out. Oh, How come? This is when I was a... Uh, I was a graduate student working on an ex experiment at Fermilab, which is a particle accelerator outside of Chicago. And I thought, you know, I really want to get to, into the city, and I wanted to take, I thought, okay, I'm going to take an acting class. Well, unfortunately for that plan, the acting classes had already started. But the bizarre thing is that this was October, and there's only one university that I know of that actually starts in October, and that's the University of Chicago. And, uh, and I discovered this cosmology class I could take. So a couple times a week, I drove in very early. And those who know me know that doing anything very early is not my style. But <laughs> I got so turned on by this class that I ended up actually switching to become the PhD student of the man teaching the class, David Schramm. <laughs> so there was a, it, was, it was a fork in the road, depending on what classes were offered. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, a bit of a delicate question here. But since you raised the issue of gender uh, a few moments ago, I do want to pursue that just a little bit. Uh, because we know, of course, that the numbers of women involved in the sciences uh, in the past certainly has been smaller than the number of men involved. And you have, you have written that you have learned how to deflect male advances from a time that you were a bar hostess in Tokyo. And I guess I'm wondering mm. whether these skills are necessary in the world of science. I have thought about this, and I realize that I'm the first generation of women that has gotten paid to do science, to do, in my case, theoretical physics. Because the previous generation, they had to do it for free. Nobody was going to hire them at a university, on the whole. So I'm, you know, I'm pretty lucky that I was in that situation. But I also like to think that since that time, in the last 25 years, that the world has improved, that the, the, the physics world has become more accepting of women. And so, uh, but uh, is there still, are there still these issues? Yes, but they're getting better. So I just remember walking into Fermilab, the same particle accelerator that I talked about. There's a giant cafeteria and there's thousands of men sitting there and I would walk in and all the heads would turn and it's like terrifying, you know, as a <laughs> student, you're thinking, oh my God, they're judging me, da, da, da. But now when you go there, the, 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 numbers, the, the, the numbers are different. So I think but what I'm told, studies show that once you get up to maybe 25% women, then the whole culture of the field changes. And a lot of that jockeying, men when, men when they're together, especially if the, the insecure students, they tend to brag a lot and jockey for position and da, da, da. If you can remove some of that, and just by having women around, people behave in a more natural way. I mean, there are 50% of this, of this species are female, right? So as soon as you have more women around, I think that behavior becomes more, more muted and more, and more normal. And, and the same goes then, f I, I, I hope, for the, 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 ne the, uh, the negative attention from the form of uh, people play, being too interested in you. So I'm, I'm hoping that is also toning down. Give us a sense of what your life is like right now, though. For example, when you go to a conference or when you step into a lab, uh, is it still, I mean, you're in the minority every time, I presume. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, but the numbers have gotten better. The numbers have gotten much better. What do the numbers look so like now? Going into a faculty meeting is not awkward. It's not awkward anymore. I just say what I think. You know, I'm also a senior person in the field, so people recognize me. I have, uh, I'm known, and so I can say what I think anyhow. But I think in general, for it's, it, I think things are getting better in, in that regard. And so my uh, my advice to two young women is, for God's sake, if you have the passion to, to do this, and I think a lot of people, people in general, are interested in science. It's a very exciting subject. What is the universe made of, and what is out there? And so if you have this passion, then see through all of this. If, if there's negativity, see through it. Keep going. Stay positive. Good. Let me pick up on this notion about uh, what's out there in the universe. A uh, hundred years ago, Albert Einstein uh, said that the universe was stationary, didn't expand, didn't contract. Uh, earlier in our mm -hmm. conversation, you said that's not the case. Are we 100% mm -hmm. certain today that that's not true? Oh, yeah. That's been... The, the uh, measurements of that were done in 1929. So Edwin Hubble was looking through the telescopes in the Angeles Mountains uh, in California, which, by the way, these, those mountains, uh, I, I had a sabbatical at Caltech, and looking at those mountains every day until I tried to climb them, I didn't get it. They're as high as, as the Rockies. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, so at the top of those, there's, a, there's an observatory, and what he did was look at distant, uh, at galaxies, and he, there, there are atoms that emit light in those galaxies, and the, but the waves, by the time they got to us, were stretched. So he, he could make those measurements and say, wait a minute, these atoms are looking funny. It's as though you draw a wave on the surface of a balloon, and then you watch that as you blow up the balloon, the wave stretches. So he came to the conclusion, well, the universe must be expanding to explain these measurements. And so the fact that the universe was expanding was actually settled in 1929. And even at that time, Einstein conceded, OK, universe is not static. That you can theorize, as usual, you can theorize your favorite view of the universe, but nature is nature. And you have to, observations win. So universe is, there's no doubt about it. The universe is expanding. Well, let me pursue that metaphor of the balloon again. If it's constantly expanding, do we worry at some point down the road, this balloon, this universe, is going to pop? <laughs> well, our universe is, um, we're not living on the surface of a balloon. So in <laughs> fact, our, it, it's like take a cube and uh, take each side out to infinity. So up and down, take that to infinity, left and right, and so on. And, and so it's, it's this, in three dimensions, it's this infinite universe. And things are moving apart from one another, and they will just keep doing that. Now, it, it, as far as the infinite future, of course, we don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, it's possible that this expanding cube, for some reason, will start recontracting. We don't have any evidence for that now. We don't think that's what's going to happen. That sort of goes counter to everything we know about the universe. But the idea of a popping balloon, that's not going to happen. OK, glad to know that. Uh, in our last minute <laughs> or so here, uh, I, I do need to ask you the thing I ask every theoretical physicist who comes on this program, and that is, do you think we're alone in this universe? No, we are, we are definitely not alone in this universe. We are definitely not alone in this galaxy. So in the last five to 10 years, oh, it's just been mind boggling. The number of new planets that have been discovered, nobody expected that. It, see, it, it appears that every single star has a planetary system around it. I mean, so think about that. There's planets everywhere, and some of them have got to have similar well, they call it the Goldilocks zone. You have to be not too close to your star, not too far away from your star. And then that allows you to have an atmosphere and water and, and so on. And, and yeah, I'm pretty sure that not too far from us, I mean, in, in the sense, compared to the infinite universe, somewhere inside our galaxy, there's definitely life. In fact, there might have been life on Mars, not intelligent life, but there's water on Mars. There's, uh, there's probably organic molecules. So life, is, life has been closer than, than anybody would have thought a decade ago. So yeah, we're not alone in the universe. OK, not alone in terms of life. How about in terms of intelligent life? OK, I would even go with no, we're not alone in, as far as intelligent life. Hmm. So I don't see why it wouldn't have formed at one of these other planetary systems, these other solar systems. And then people always ask, OK, how come we haven't heard from them? And I would say that if, if, they're, less, if they're less advanced than we are, they couldn't have gotten here yet. 
And if they're more advanced than we are, and they came by chance b past our planet, why should they be interested? I mean, I, pa I walk by ant colonies all the time, and I'm really not interested in them, so I just ignore <laughs> them. Or maybe, if with any bad luck, if a kid came along, would step on that ant colony and squish them. So let's just hope they don't pay attention to us, because I don't want them to come and, 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 and just destroy us for the hell of it. Klaatu, Barada, but, Necto. Yes, I think intelligent life is out there. <laughs> good to know. Uh, you know what, Dr. Fries, it's so good of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight. One of the reasons I love doing this program is I learn something new every day, and you, you sure taught this student a lot in our last uh, 25 minutes here on TVO tonight. Thanks very much for being with us. Well, thanks so much for the interview. It was great to talk to you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.